Okay, well, as everybody's filtering in, let's take a look at this and see how it works out. Um, the way I normally frame this question is, if your teacher were to tell you that they can throw a baseball at a rate of 90 feet per second, is that a believable claim? And we look at that 90 feet per second seems like a large number, but it's not one we're familiar with. We're used to seeing speeds in miles per hour. So to make this easier to judge whether that's a reasonable claim or not, we need to make that conversion. So I'm going to set this off. We are converting 90 feet per second into miles per hour. Now, we talked about that dimensional analysis, and that's what we've been using to make all of our conversions so far, is lining up the units, um, cross-canceling the units we're trying to get rid of in order to convert it to new ones. So when we mentioned rates and ratios a couple of weeks ago, when we saw something like 90 feet per second, remember that's called a unit rate. And we have to think of it like this, as 90 feet over one second. Now we have to change both of those. Feet has to become miles and seconds have to become hours. So we're gonna to need to, to do conversion factors on both units and we'll just have to pick one to go first. And it really doesn't matter which one we change first. So let's go ahead and change the feet first. So now since feet are on top here, to cancel them out, I'm gonna put them on bottom. So they'll cross cancel out. And we're changing feet into miles. So we have to ask, do we have a direct conversion from feet to miles? And we do. One mile is 5,280 feet. So there the feet cross cancel out. We now have miles in the numerator, which is what we want for our result. We still have seconds in the denominator, and we want that denominator to be hours. So we need to work on that. The seconds are in the denominator, so we're going to put seconds in the numerator up top. So now those will cross cancel out. We don't have a direct relationship from seconds to hours, but we can go from seconds to minutes. One minute equals 60 seconds. So now the seconds have cross canceled out, and we have minutes on the bottom. We need to get to hours, so we have to go at least one more step. So we don't want the minutes, we're getting rid of those, so we'll put those on top. Again, those are gonna cross cancel out. And we do have a direct relationship and equivalency between hours and minutes. One hour is 60 minutes. So the minutes cross cancel out. And now what we have in the numerator is miles, and in the denominator, the only units we have is hours, which is what we want for our result. So now we will multiply it out and divide to get our final result. On the top of this, we have 90 times 1 is 90, times 60 is 5,400, times another 60 is 324,000. The only units up there is miles. On bottom, we have all ones except for the 5280, so 5,280, and the only units on bottom is hours. So now we have to divide that out. 324,000 divided by 5,280. Oops, my divide didn't work. Let's try that again. 324,000 divided by 5,280. 61.36. So that 90 foot per second fastball is really only 61.36 miles per hour. So not terribly impressive. So a relatively believable statement. So what we're doing here is we are converting rates. And that's one of the things what we want to look at for one of our, our final topics for, for this unit today is how do we convert those rates? And we are going to start out with our standard units, just like I did here. Um, so we might have an example where we have a flow rate of, or a concentration, I should say, of seven ounces per pint. 
And we need to change that in order to mass mix this, this mixture, this solution. We want to change that to pounds per gallon. So we'll write this out as seven ounces over one pint. We need to change both units again. We need to change the ounces into pounds and the pints into gallons. So let's start out with the ounces. The ounces are on top, so to get rid of them, I'm going to put them on bottom. And we do have a direct link from ounces to pounds, so I'm going to put pounds on top. That relationship is one pound is 16 ounces. So the ounces cancel out. We now have pounds in the numerator, which is what we want. We've got to get rid of the pints now. Pints are on bottom, so we get rid of them. We put them on top. Um, pints, our next step would be to go to quarts. I'm just use QT. So one quart is two pints. The pints cross cancel. We now have pounds on top, which is what we want, but we have quarts on bottom. So to get rid of the quarts, quarts on top and gallons on bottom, which is what we want to have. One gallon is four quarts. So the quarts cancel out. We have seven times one pound is seven pounds, times two is 14 pounds, times four is 56 pounds. On bottom, we have 1 times 16 is 16 times 1 times 1 gallon is 16 gallons. So that is 56 pounds per 16 gallons. We divide that out. 56 divided by 16 is actually 3.5. And our units is going to be pounds per gallon. So I double check my math there. It is 3.5. This is 3.5 pounds per one gallon. So you can see dealing with these rates, um, we have more than one unit that we have to make sure we're converting at a time. Um, another very common situation might be, and I might have to give you this, uh, this equivalency that one cubic foot equals, and we're going to say 7.5 gallons. Um, depending on how you round it, it can be like 7.48. But we're going to say 7.5 to keep things simple. And we have a pump that works at 12 CFM. CFM is a standard rating for a pump. CFM stands for cubic feet per minute. So 12 CFM is really 12 cubic feet per one minute. We want to know what that is in gallons per minute. So in this case, we'll set this problem up. 12 cubic feet per one minute. And we look at the units we have. Well, the cubic feet have to change. We need to change those into gallons. The minutes, however, are okay because we want it left in minutes. So we only have to change one thing. So on our conversion factor here, we are getting rid of the cubic feet. Since the cubic feet are on top, we put cubic feet on bottom, and going to gallons. So the gallons be on top. And we can go back to this relationship, this equivalency that we were given. One cubic foot is 7.5 gallons. So now, cubic feet cross cancel. On top, we have 12 times 7.5, which is 90 gallons. And on bottom, we've got one minute times one, which is just one minute. So that's already a unit rate. That is simply 90 gallons per minute. Well, with our metric measurements, we didn't use the dimensional analysis. If you look at the examples in the textbook, they did use the dimensional analysis on the measurements. But we didn't have to. So what happens when we run into these compound units with our metric measurement? Well, let's say that we have something listed as 48 milliliters. Oops, let's change that number there. Let's say it is 75 milliliters 
Whisper. Um, per kilogram. And we need to know how many milliliters that would be per gram. So we're changing one of our units here. In fact, what we're changing is the denominator. So we're going to write this out. 75 milliliters per kilogram is 75 milliliters over one kilogram. Now let's break down what we have and what we need. We have currently milliliters in the numerator. We need milliliters in the numerator. So that number isn't going to change. We have kilograms in the denominator. We need grams in the denominator. So that's the one we have to change. So we have to get rid of these kilograms down here. To do that, we have a conversion factor with kilograms in top. Now, grams on bottom, we know that one kilogram is a thousand grams. Kilograms cross cancel, and we have 75 milliliters on top over 1,000 grams. We divide that out, that's 0 0.075 milliliters per gram. Now, um, we could have done this calculation without using the dimensional analysis and the conversion factor like that. We have 75 milliliters per one kilogram. We could actually just use that chart for moving the decimal point. We're not changing the milliliters, so we're going to leave that as 75 milliliters for now. On bottom, we're changing one, one kilogram into grams. And on our chart, kilograms to grams is three spots to the right. So we move our decimal point three spots to the right. We have to add zeros to fill in the blank spot. So that is... A thousand grams. And now the last step is the same. We still do have to divide those out. 75 divided by a thousand is 0 0.075, and then milliliters per gram. What if both units have to be changed? We might have. Oh, 720 milligrams per milliliter, and we might need to change that to grams per liter for mixing larger batches. So again, our 720 milligrams per milliliter becomes 720 milligrams over one milliliter. Now we could use the dimensional analysis, but I'm going to do the shortcut. Here we have milligrams and we are converting to grams. So 750 milligrams per gram. On our chart, here's grams, decigrams, centigrams, milligrams. So to get from milligrams to grams, I'm going three spots to the left. So I move my decimal point three spots to the left, which gives us 0.72 grams. Then we have to do the milliliters to liters. Well, on our chart, this would be liters, deciliters, centiliters, milliliters. We are still moving from milliliters to liters, three spots to the left. Here's our decimal point. We have to go three spots to the left. So we go one, we have to add a zero to go two, and then another zero to go three. That is. 0 0.001 milliliters. And now we finish this off. Remember, this has to be a unit rate. So we have to divide by this bottom number of 0 0.001. Well, 0 .0, or 0 0.72 divided by 0 0.001 is 720. So that'll be grams over one milliliter or just per milliliter. There's a case where because both units converted the same way, the final number is the same. It's 
still 720, even though the units have changed. So let's do a couple more examples of those just to make sure we've got some practice with them. Um, let's take something like 1.4. Liters per hour and convert it into milliliters per minute. So, this will be looking at a flow rate where I want to change that flow rate. Therefore, this is 1.4 liters over one hour. Now, we do have both units that need to be changed here. One is metric. Unfortunately, time does not have a metric equivalent. So time is always going to be a standard conversion. So we are going to have to change the hours. But we don't necessarily have to do them both at the same time. Let me show you what I mean. We can change this from liters per hour to milliliters per hour in our first step. So one hour is still going to be one hour. The 1.4 liters to milliliters on our chart from liters to milliliters is three spots to the right. So we move our decimal point three spots to the right. So we go one, to go two, we got to add a zero, and three, we add another zero. So that is 1,400 milliliters. So we now have milliliters per hour. Milliliters is fine, but we want our time to be in minutes. So we have to convert our hours into minutes. Since the hours are on bottom, we put hours on top to cancel them out. We put minutes on bottom. One hour is 60 minutes. Now the hours cancel out. We got 1,400 milliliters times one is 1,400 milliliters. On bottom, we've got one times 60 minutes, which is 60 minutes. And so now 1,400 divided by 60 is 2. Point, or sorry 23.33 and that's going to be in milliliters per minute on a test by the way if not otherwise instructed um we'll look at rounding these if you go to at least two decimal places Okay, well, I think you guys get the picture of working with the dual units or with the converting rates. There are a couple of other things I want to go over. Um, there are some specialty units that are used in medicine. They're referred to as apothecary units. We mentioned on last week, Friday, that the DRAM was one, was one of the first units to be used as an apothecary unit. Remember. One ounce in the standard system is equal to 16 drams. Um, a dram is actually considerably larger than a gram. A lot of people confuse them because it sounds metric, but it's not. Smaller than a dram, we did have a unit called a minnow. One, now not a fluid ounce, but a fluid dram is equivalent to 60 minims. The min, if you think of minutes, is actually a standard prefix that does mean 60. So 60 minutes in an hour, 60 minims in one fluid gram. We talked about the grains as well. We said that one pound is equal to 7,000 grains. Now be careful, the abbreviation for grains is GR. It's really easy to confuse that with grams. Remember, grams is just a G. We had also mentioned last Friday that grains was one of the units from our standard system 
that was absorbed into the metric system because of the demand for for it in medical applications. So if we look at our metric apothecary units, the grain was absorbed in as one gram is equal to 15 grains. Now I'm going to make a note on that in just a second because it technically isn't 15 grains, but we'll talk about that in a second. For milligrams, one grain equals approximately 60 milligrams. Now if we look at this, that is doesn't really work out because if I were to convert one gram into 15 grains and then convert that 15 grains into milligrams 15 times 60 I only get 900 milligrams well We've seen where it's very entrenched in us that one gram is not 900 milligrams, it's 1,000 milligrams. So you can see these conversions with the grains are very sloppy. Um, it actually comes out that a grain, a one gram is actually slightly over 16 grains if we use the standard unit grain, the 7,000 grains per pound. And that one grain is actually... 63 between 62 and 63 milligrams and if you do that out the, the conversions are perfect it is 1000 milligrams in a gram but because those numbers were so awkward you know having 16 point whatever and 62 point whatever for those conversion factors they rounded them they simplified them you may however run into if you're dealing with chemistry or uh, um pharmacology, where you are dealing with the, the chemistry behind some of these medications, you may run into conversions where they use different numbers than these to get more on the exact side of it. For our purposes, though, we will use simply that. Um, and then we have the minimums are absorbed in as one milliliter is approximately 16 minimums. So keep wanting to put U in minimums. And now then, we've talked about conversions between our metric system and standard. One of them in our apothecary units. One fluid ounce is approximately 30 milliliters. Um, this is one that in your book is a little confusing because on one page it has one fluid ounce equals 30 milliliters. And then I think a page or two later, it says one fluid ounce is 29.9 milliliters. It's actually 29.93 something. Um, if you use either one, you'll be okay. I tend to use the one fluid ounce as 30 milliliters just because it's simpler and that's the one I have memorized. And of course, there are other conversions between them if you look at um, our teaspoons. You know, one teaspoon is approximately five milliliters. In the medical field, we don't use teaspoons for much anymore. Some of your, your older fashioned medications were a one teaspoon or one tablespoon or a half a tablespoon administration. Um, so some of those might need conversions. That's one that's not necessarily important medically, hugely important medically anymore. But as everything switches over to metric, um, on the cooking side of things, recipes and stuff will probably be converted over as well. Now, the next one in the apothecary unit is drops. We've mentioned this in some of our examples so far, but we haven't really defined the drops. The abbreviation for drops, remember, is GTT. Some textbooks will use, will use GTTS for drops. GTT is our abbreviation for drops. One drop of water is 
is the standard that we use in our measuring system. So if we're using one a drop as being a drop of water, there are 60 drops in one teaspoon. Now, again, those were the size of a teaspoon was adjusted to make 60 drops fit into it. However, in the medical field, drops are not necessarily of water. So thicker, thicker um, substances will have less drops per teaspoon or per, uh, so that comes out to this four, sorry, five milliliters per teaspoon that comes out to about 12 drops per milliliter metric. Um, things that are thicker than water will have less than 12 drops. Most of our medications are actually thinner than water. So they'll have more than 12 drops per milliliter. So that makes up most of the units we'll need. There are some weird units out there like teacups and stuff like that on the book list, but medically they're unimportant, so we're not going to take time to go over them. Um, you would not be tested on something like that. But one thing that you do need to be familiar with is temperature. And temperature needs to get treated a little bit separate from all of our other conversions for one main reason. It lacks the thing that makes all of our other conversions possible. A common zero point. What do I mean by that? Well, if we're measuring the length, it doesn't matter what units we're using. Zero inches is equal to zero centimeters, is equal to zero feet, is equal to zero meters, is equal to zero rods. I mean... Zero is zero. No matter what units you're using it in, something that's zero units long is zero feet, zero inches, zero meters. It doesn't matter. Same for weight or mass. I mean, zero pounds is zero grams, which is zero ounces or zero kilograms. It doesn't matter what unit we're using to measure something. If it has no weight or no mass, it's zero. Period. And of course, the same for capacity. You know, zero gallons is equal to zero liters, which is equal to zero quarts, and equal to zero milliliters, and equal to zero pints. I mean, zero is zero again. Well, in our temperature scales, there is not a common zero point. So we have the Fahrenheit scale and the Celsius scale. The Fahrenheit scale is our standard scale. The, the Celsius scale, of course, is the metric. The Fahrenheit scale started out basically, um, I believe it was developed in Switzerland, but I'm not, don't quote me on that. Um, actually, no, it was Austria. But anyway, um, the Fahrenheit scale developed that the coldest day or the, the, on average, the coldest day of the year was about zero degrees. So they use that as their starting point of zero, and they built up from there. Well, as time went on, some important benchmarks became the temperature at which water freezes. And, of course, then as you go up the scale, the temperature at which water boils. And so they, because they had set that zero degree temperature to be, you know, the, the, on average, the coldest day of the year, water actually froze 
at a temperature well above that. In the Fahrenheit scale, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Water boils at, this is one that people are less familiar with, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, in the Celsius scale, they decided they wanted to adjust that. Since every region of the world had a different coldest day of the year, they wanted something that was relatively consistent from one region to another, and that was the freezing of water. So they set the temperature at which water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, and the temperature at which water boils, since everything seems to be a power of 10 in the metric system, they thought going from zero to 10 degrees was going to make it a degree too big. Um, from zero to 1,000 degrees was just going to be too, too many divisions, made a degree too small. So they went from zero to 100. So 100 degrees is where water boils. Well, we'll see there's two things. One, we don't have that common zero point. Two, the degrees between water freezing and water boiling in the Fahrenheit system, their standard system, is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. In the Celsius system, 0 minus 100 is just 100 degrees Celsius. So you can see 1 degree Fahrenheit is actually much smaller, a much smaller change in temperature than 1 degree Celsius. So to do the conversion, we had to worry about two things. We had to move the zero point, and we had to change the size of the degrees. It was that lack of a common zero complaint that caused the most problems. I mean, all of our other units, we've had that difference in size. You know, a centimeter being smaller than an inch, we could still use the dimensional analysis to convert it. For temperature, we have to use a formula. So our formula to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius requires us to take our Fahrenheit temperature and first adjust the zero point. Well, Fahrenheit starts at 32, Celsius starts at zero. So we subtract 32 to adjust that zero point. And then we multiply by that ratio, one degree Fahrenheit, well, so one degree Celsius to one degree Fahrenheit is 100 over 180, that reduces to five over nine. So we multiply that by five ninths. So the temperature in degrees Celsius is equal to five ninths times the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So let's use that to convert a temperature. One common one, Human body temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So to find human body temperature in degrees Celsius, we put 98.6 in for F. So 5 ninths times parentheses, 98.6 minus 32. Now at this point, order of operations takes over. In the parentheses, we have something to do. That's an enclosing symbol, so we're going to do that. 98.6 minus 32 is 66.6. .6. Now we've done everything inside the parentheses, so we're going to multiply by the 5 ninths. 5 ninths times 66.6 .6 is 37 degrees. So 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is 37 degrees Celsius. Going the other direction from degrees Celsius into degrees Fahrenheit. We have to reverse that process. What we did up here, we subtracted 32 and multiplied by 5 ninths. To reverse that, we're going to divide by 5 ninths. Dividing by 5 ninths is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of 9 fifths. Then add back the 32. So we take our temperature in degrees Celsius, we multiply by the 9 fifths, and we add the 32, which is degrees Fahrenheit. So let's say the weatherman tells you that the temperature today is going to be 12 degrees Celsius. 
So yeah, I wonder, is that a nice day or is that a, a bad day? So we put 12 in for C. So 9 fifths times 12 plus 32. So again, it's order of operations. We start out with the 9 fifths times 12. 9 fifths times 12 is, what is that, 21.6. And then we add the 21.6 plus 35, which makes that 56.6 degrees. So that 12 degrees Celsius is 56.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If this were July, that wouldn't be a very nice day, but for February, that's a pretty nice day. Okay, so remember that Friday... Is the unit two test. You will have the whole hour, the whole class period on Friday to work on it, and up to, uh, I mean, up to a total of two hours, but it, you will have the class period on Thursday, the additional time you need to make arrangements to get a location if needed. Um, there is assignments that apply to the stuff we've talked about today. Page 118 in the book. 1 through 19 the odds, and page 123 in the book, 1 through 21 the odds. And just a reminder of topics that you should have, be familiar with for this test. And we have, obviously, the measurement conversions. And, of course, the rate conversions. That's those two units that we started out the class with today. So dual units, we call that. But you'll also need to make sure, oops, I get my note sheet here, um, that you remember scientific notation. Both Converting from standard to scientific and also doing operations with. Adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing in scientific notation. We have ratio and proportion. I should say ratio rate and proportion. There are going to be a few just generic proportions and rates, but the big thing here is going to be able to pick those rates and ratios out of word problems. So if you go back and look in the pages of homework with ratio and, pro ratio and proportion, make sure you are looking at the word problems for those. Along with ratio and proportion, there were percent. Um, one of the things people struggled with on the first test dealing with percents was that percent increase or percent decrease. So make sure you're familiar with those and take a look at those. And then we have our basic algebra. You know, solving equations. One that people struggle with is rearranging formulas. You know, for example, if I give you a formula, P equals M over T plus A, if I want to solve that for M, So I'm trying to get M by itself. We have to subtract A. So we've got P minus A equals M over T. And then we have to multiply by the T. So the T cancels out over here. P minus A times T is T times P minus A. 
equals m. And then, of course, we have our mixture problems. Those mixture problems were things like How much 21% solution should be mixed with 120 milliliters of thirty-seven percent solution? to create 33% solution. So make sure you look back at those and you're familiar with setting up those formulas. A lot of people do struggle with setting up those equations and solving them. Oh yeah, that is about it for, for everything in unit two. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, we'll see you on Friday then for test two. Um, like I said, you are allowed up to two hours, so if it is possible in your schedule at the school, if you get to the room early, you don't have to wait for the network to come up. You can start. You are allowed to use your books and your notes and your calculator on the whole test this time around. So like I said, if you get in the room early and you want to get started, go ahead so that you can use your time. We do have up to two hours. You guys have a great day and we'll see you on Friday.